Thing. I think we are in good shape. So make sure with the microphone. You're unmuted. Okay. <laughs> great. I think we want to unmute it so they can hear all of your great comments. Uh, and there we go. Fantastic. Well, friends, thanks for coming. I, I'm really excited uh, for today's class. Um, I'm excited to have you here. Thank you. And really, I, I know you can be in, in many places. And I'm excited to learn from you. I just about one second ago. It's Tuesday. Oh, like I know. Right, right. I know. I, I was all far off too. So. Um, but no, it, it, it's a happy, happy Tuesday. It's a nice, warm, sunny Tuesday. Uh, in the middle of January, and it's great to be with, with all of you. Uh, as always, we'll start with a prayer. Uh, Sarah, would you please offer our opening prayer? Thank you so much. Dear Father in heaven, we're very grateful for this opportunity that we have to be in this building and to feel the Holy Spirit in this building. And we're thankful for Mr. Gentile and for the preparation that he has put forth to teach us um, through the journals of the Prophet Joseph Smith. We're thankful for the many resources that we have to be able to learn more of thee and thy gospel and to learn through the examples of thy prophet. And please bless us to be able to have thy spirit with us and to continue to have thy spirit with us and to be safe and help up, uplift those around us. In the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. And as, as you feel inclined when, when you pray, you can pray in Spanish if you'd like to, to, to uh, practice. <laughs> I don't know what word is. <laughs> That's okay. You, you will, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be fluent by the time you come home. So. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. And then I'll come to the class when I come home and I will scream. Fantastic. Well, if, if you ever want to promise or to, to, to practice, <laughs> please come and practice with us. Thank you. Hello? All right. Uh, well, this is our first time this semester taking a look at the new journal itself. I'm very excited. We're going to see. This is the 1841-1842 journal. Uh, the appendices go a little bit later with some documents that you may have taken a look at. Um, but really, we're going to stay uh, mostly in the year 1842. Then um, we're going to see that. This will take us here from the 13th of December to uh, the 3rd of February. And we're going to see go Christmas come and go. I, I was happy they didn't have any any writing on Christmas. I, I was hoping that meant they spent a really nice time with their family and <laughs> weren't uh, worried with any with any other matters. But uh, as I was thinking about Joseph Smith the prophet, uh, I, I was so just delighted to see uh, this quote here. And this is one. This is actually the first presidency to say this is uh, from about a year before. And I always try to give you something that isn't in the journals uh, at, at the very first because well, you haven't read it already. It might be nice. Um, but the Times and the Seasons was a really neat newspaper. It was uh, published in Nauvoo. It dealt mostly with doctrinal matters. We'd also see uh, that there would be the loss, which would then become another newspaper. But um, essentially that would deal with other, other matters, sort of the, with the more secular news. Um, but the Times and the Seasons was devoted to doctrinal matters in the First Presidency and others. The Apostles, they would write for this newspaper. And it was almost like the end side. Uh, where members would be able to read, and here's the, you can call the First Presidency message, it was to the whole body of the saints, um, and here is what Joseph and the other said, the work of the Lord in these last days is one of vast magnitude and almost beyond the comprehension of mortals. Its glories are past description, and its grandeur insurpassable. The purposes of our God are great, his love unfathomable, his wisdom infinite, and his power unlimited. Therefore, the saints have cause to rejoice and to be glad, knowing that this God is our God forever and ever, and he will be our guide unto them. So, as you take a look at this wonderful message from the First Presidency, let's read it together. What does this quote teach you about Joseph Smith, the prophet? What do you see that just fills your heart with so much joy as you think about Joseph teaching this to the saints? I think it helps show some of what Joseph has seen and vision. Yes. And um, things that have been opened up to his mind. And some things he couldn't share right away, some he did you know, throughout the years. But um, 
it just fills you with excitement and gratitude. I love that. Thank you. Right. Joseph Smith knew personally, from personal experience, God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. And so when he's talking about each one of these different qualities that are just unable to be measured, they're so great, and each one of them unfathomable, infinite, unlimited, insurpassable, etc. Right? He knows, as you said, it's a wonderful comment from personal experience. And that is such a humbling thing. But yet, how reassuring is it? It would be as if you, know, you went and you know, got to meet someone that we all really look up to. And we say, oh, how was it? Tell us about him. Tell us about her. You know, whoever it was, please. And you come back, oh, it's better than you even imagined. You know? And he's giving us this going, thank you. Other reasoning, what would you reason that we can be so glad about that Joseph is trying to teach us. It's actually a verse that I oh, remember yeah. reading, and it's almost exactly like this. Yeah. Oh, and it's in Alma 2625. Are you okay? Please, of course. We'd love to read it. I just remember passing this one and reading it. Yeah. Oh, God, I remember. Anyway, so um, it says, Now have we not reason to rejoice? Yea, I send to you, there never were men that had so great reason to rejoice as we since the world began. Yea, and my joy is carried away even unto boasting my, in my God. For he has all power, all wisdom, and all understanding. He comprehendeth all things, and he is, he is a merciful being, even unto salvation, to those who will repent and believe on his, his name. So <laughs> it just makes me excited that there's, we have that joy now, and that they have that joy, and we can share that joy. <laughs> yes, we can share that joy, even with people far away who speak Spanish. <laughs> we can share that joy. And, and, I, and I love this. Um, this is so happy. There's so many people in the world you know, who are struggling. And by the way, I, lo I love that verse. It just ties so perfectly together. So that we weave them right together. Um, and, and I think it's so happy. As you look at all of these different qualities of God, which one would you say has meant the most to you in your life? I mean, there are many. I think it's a hard question, though. <laughs> I think there are two that stand out to me, but I'm always curious to hear from you. Hello, welcome. You know, well, I would say, first of all, his love. Right, right. And then, um, well, I would have to say his wisdom and his power. Yeah. It's just that if you just trust him, he knows a better way that, right. you know, is different from my way, perhaps. But um, just know that he is in charge. It's going the way he's planned. He has the wisdom and the power to uh, bring forth his word. Yeah. Oh, I love Thank you for that reasoning. Um, it reminds me, of, uh, my father is really great at math. Uh, he's an accountant. He loves it. seems to come easily for him. He enjoys it. You know, he can, he can sing, you know, some musical from the 40s, you know, and be on his calculator and be on the phone, like, all at the same time somehow. I'm not sure how it works. Um, but especially the singing in the other book. Um, but I think he slips it in sometimes. Um, and it was always interesting. He'd help me with my math homework. You know, I'd be working so hard to understand something. And he'd be like, oh, you just do this. I'm like, Dad, it doesn't make any sense at all. You know? He's like, no, 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 just trust me. Just do this. And I'd start to try to learn these patterns. You know, and I'd be, okay, okay, I, I'm, I, I don't fully understand it yet, but let me try to do it this way. And I would try. And eventually, I would start to pick it up. And once I caught the vision of what those shortcuts were allowing me to do, it was so fast, it was so easy, and it really helped me out. And even to this day, there are things that I learned from my dad in these one-on-one -on -one help sessions and math that I don't know if I really could have learned from anyone else in that same way, but yet it took that trust. And so there are times where in our finite understanding, you know, God will say, oh, you know, you need to do this. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I've got this, this, this is lined up, this is logical, this leads to this, this is no, 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 you know. They're like, no, you need to get this problem again. You're like, oh, maybe I just ate too many burritos last night. That, that can't be the spirit. That, that's that's got to be something you can push it aside, you know. And then finally, right, you're saying, wait, I can't deny that I have felt something really incredible. And you trust, and you take that shortcut or whatever it is, and then you look back and you realize, wow, I never would have gotten here without him, you know. And, and once again, why does he tell us these things? Because he loves us. 
right? And why do those things lead to doors opening and deliverance? Because he's got power. It's so amazing. You know, I just I love that. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Other just favorite qualities of God, and Joseph knew them. And we can too. Please. I think in the day where they had committed the adversary's greatest tools are despair yeah. and despondency and um, self-doubt, all those demons. Right, right. <laughs> um, the, the whole line of saying that saints have cause to rejoice. Right, God. right. And, and that to realize how precious it is that we have this knowledge and that we have been given much to be grateful. Something that every member of the body is precious and burdened and burdened. And that's not what he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to dwell there. He wants us to learn from those things. Yeah. But to not dwell there. Oh, I love that. We should be careful not to resent the very things that God has given us to help us put on the divine nature. Right? Life will be hard at times, but we have so much reason to rejoice. We signed up for a weight class to get stronger. He lets us lift heavy weights. Sometimes we, figuratively speaking, shake our fist to the sky and say, this weight is too heavy, it's going to crush me. You know, but he knows. And we can rejoice that, wow, my spiritual biceps are rippling. You know, I mean, it, <laughs> sometimes we don't always feel to say that. Especially when we look at the like, really puny earthly biceps. Uh, but I'm hoping that, you know, as we just keep putting one foot in front of the other, spiritually speaking, that we will one day be able to look back and say, oh, he's been so good to us the whole time, even the hardest times. Maybe that was when he was the best to us. Uh, and, and that's huge, right? Be grateful when God trusts you enough to let you struggle. Right, Elder, Elder Scott. Um, anyway, um, so I love this. Let's think about Joseph knowing all these things and so many more um, and how these can bless our life in our relationship with our God. I, I love that, our God. This God is our God, the one who has all of this to offer. Um, all right, thank you so much. Um, just a little bit of context here. I, I think we'll, we'll go sort of a month before and you know, a month later just to kind of see where we've been, where we're headed. This is so November 1841 to March 1842, just a little bit of historical context. On the 8th of November, what we'll see is that finally uh, Joseph will say, you know, let's not use the streams and the Mississippi anymore, and you know, we can do this in the right place. Uh, and so we finally see that dedication of the wooden baptismal font in the basement of the Nabu Temple. And from that time forth, they were in the temple, in the basement of the temple, as it was being constructed. Because remember, by the time Joseph Smith died in June 1844, the temple was only half completed. Um, and so just, I mean, this really took a long time. And so here we are in 1841, even, you know, three years or so before that. Uh, and we're going to see that here they are doing these baptisms for the dead. And they were so excited. Just imagine. You know, you, you know your grandmother didn't have the opportunity to hear the gospel like you did. Here you are, one of these new converts in Nauvoo, and finally, this wonderful doctrine. Finally, they're in the font for grandma, and, and they're just, oh, I can only imagine being one of the first to be able to do that. Uh, we'll see that uh, November 21st of 1841, the first baptisms for the dead, then after this dedication here in this same month, are actually performed in, the, in this temple font. We're going to see on the 5th of December, which is my daughter's birthday, uh, but not in 1841. Um, <laughs> that Joseph began proofreading a new edition of the Book of Mormon. Uh, we'll see that this first uh, copy that was printed had just some, you know, typos, little errors in the printing and all that. Um, and we'll see that they're just trying to bring it into conformance uh, with, into conformity uh, with what Joseph knew it to be. And so we'll also see here that on the 13th of December, and this is where we'll pick up, as you probably noticed, uh, which is, is just so neat to talk about our friend Willard Richards, uh, this is when uh, Willard would become the recorder for the Nauvoo Temple. Uh, he would have an office uh, in the bottom floor of Joseph's red brick store. Uh, he would record things like tithing. He'd record other offerings. And basically, he was recording um, as different goods were brought in for the temple construction. He'd record this, that, and the other. Just sort of a, a bookkeeper, if you will, uh, to try to keep track of all the supplies going in and out. Uh, for the saints, especially the building of this temple. Uh, we'd also see that this one he'd become the personal scribe for Joseph Smith. Right? And he'll keep Joseph Smith's journal, and it'll be almost daily. He was such a great example. After, I mean, we had all these struggles with church historians over the years, you know, and finally we have one who's just a firecracker. Um, he was so fantastic for us, for Joseph, 
uh, we, we, we are so blessed because Willard kept such a conscientious journal. And he has such beautiful Yes, I, I know. I know you're like, wow. I'm a calligrapher. I know yeah. I by the way, the Christmas card was oh, beautiful, oh, by the way. I assume you were the one who wrote it. Oh, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that is amazing to see. And, and what a neat thing where, as you look online or in the, in the paper copy, you can see this beautiful handwriting that Willard had. And, and he did a lot of things, too, and, and obviously practiced his handwriting throughout. Um, anyway, it will be all the way through his death um, that he'll keep this daily, almost daily journal. Um, then we'll see in 1842, on the 5th of January, the Red Brick store will be actually open for business. People will start to come and, and to buy what they had there. Um, and, and I have to say, has anyone been to the Red Brick store lately? Been a little bit? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. What were, what were your impressions? Well, it was cool. It was on a tour. Um, I guess it wasn't super recently. It was about a year and a half. Oh, oh sure. Um, That's recent to me. I mean, we didn't get as old as I am. A year, yeah. 10 years, 20 years. Yeah, recently. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was cool because they took us to the top and they talked yeah. about some of what happened there. Yes. They talked about how just the just what um, the different revelations given there and yeah. how it was the central part mm -hmm. of what happened in Nauru. Yeah. It was really cool. Yeah. No, it is, and it's just such a neat, neat place to be. And, and you know, any any time you're in just that space, you know, that has been hallowed by sacred experiences, mm -hmm. you know, you can feel it. And I, I just love that. And, um, anyway, with that said, we'll see here um, that uh, it'll be open for business finally on the 6th of February then. We'll see uh, that Joseph will have an, an unnamed son who, who will be born to Emma, who will die. Um, and it's interesting, I, I, I just took a peek because, as you know, we ended on the third. I, I couldn't help it. So just looked again, uh, and you know, there's, there's no entry there. Um, and then, as Willard's writing about Joseph, he talks about Joseph is sick in bed. Uh, it doesn't say anything else, but you, know, you just you wonder, is there a connection? what must have been a devastating loss um, and then this, this sickness that, that was talked about. Anyway, the 24th of February, we'll see that uh, Ebenezer Robinson, a printer in Nauvoo, uh, will be authorized to print 1,500 copies of this new edition of the book one that Joseph had been proofreading. And you can, you can find editions um, online if you want to take a look at some of those pages, especially with the Joseph Smith papers, you can go on and take a look. Uh, the 1st of March, 1842, the Times and the Seasons, uh, this newspaper will publish Joseph Smith's Wentworth letter. This is where we get the very famous. No one tells Andrew. Yes, as well as all the primary children know. <laughs> the articles of faith. I mean, we've all we've all sung them. Did you have a favorite tune, by the way, to any one of them? It was the fourth one that was my favorite. You like the fourth one? <laughs> uh, is it? Let's see. We believe that the first principles and ordinances of... Yeah, that one's catchy. I like, I like that. Um, and then I love how they repeat... That's a good type. Um, anyway, but so no, but we get the Articles of Faith, among other things. And, and we'll see also that there'll be a, a Book of Abraham excerpt published, along with facsimile number one. Um, and this will be here in March of 1842. So really amazing doctrinal developments that we're going to see. Um, everybody loved the Book of Abraham. Uh, they were so excited. Uh, for, for this new uh, translation. Anyway, then the 15th of March, we'll see that Joseph will officiate an installation of the Nauvoo Masonic Lodge. He'll be admitted as a member. That will also be part of the cultural life of the community in Nauvoo. Uh, we'll see, uh, once again, that uh, in those uh, you know, Masonic ceremonies, as, as Joseph will, will write about them, that there will be corruptions uh, of truths um, sort of throughout them. Some things that are just sort of new and wholly made up uh, others that will be corruptions of truth, others that will be closer than others to, to things that will become important to Joseph. Uh, we'll see sort of all just part of his plan of the Lord putting puzzle pieces together for Joseph as revelations uh, roll forth. Um, we'll see then that also another excerpt will be published along with facsimile number two, uh, and that will be published also in the Times and the Seasons. Just imagine the end sign coming out with, oh yes, and, and here we are, you know, <laughs> oh, anyway, kind of neat. But the 17th of March, we'll see something very, very important. And I'm sure you've had many dinners, perhaps, to, to celebrate this over the years. But uh, the Female Relief Society in Nauvoo, and Emma will be the first president. But that will be for a later date. We'll talk a lot more about that. But just to kind of give you some context for the revelations um, and the journal entries and all the other things that you saw uh, in what we studied for this week. So with that, here's a look at our friend. And don't you love the picture? I love his hair. I always want to kind of scrunch it, you know. Um, but this is Willard Richards, uh, one of just the, the wonderful success stories of the early converts of the church, someone who 
you know, true blue, stuck through and through all these hard times. Uh, born in Massachusetts, uh, he died in Salt Lake City. Uh, we'll see, uh, 1804 to 1854. Uh, we'll see that he was a teacher, a lecturer, a printer, doctor, clerk, postmaster. He did a lot uh, of different things. He was just such a wonderful convert for the church. He had so much to offer. Um, and Joseph uh, was able to see the Lord work through Willard to bless the church in so many ways. Uh, we'll see that he was baptized by Brigham Young. This was in Kirtland. Um, and it was neat because in 1836, you'll see that this will be after, of course, uh, the April uh, visitations of those who brought keys to the temple. Uh, so those were already in place when he joined the church. And then notice, the, uh, you know, a year later, not even, not even a year later, half a year later, um, he'd be on a mission to England that would last all the way until 1841. <laughs> Can you imagine? Um, you're, you'll see people come into the church and just imagine, by the end of your mission, you know, they should be heading off to England for, you know, six years or whatever. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, for you. Uh, okay, anyway, that's it. Then he will be, uh, you'll see, in April of 1840, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. He'll be one who replaces some of those who apostatized, and he'll serve faithfully there. Uh, we know that he'll be the temple reporter and scribe for Joseph. Uh, 13th of December, that's in the journal entries that we'll see. He'll also be the church historian. Well, please, hi. Uh, he became a member of the Quorum of the Twelve while he was on this mission? Yes. <laughs> kind of a neat opportunity for him. To be called, you know, by letter, probably. Right? And, and, so, and so we're going to see that, you know, there were so many, just the church was in this great period of flux, you know, and, and you know, you could be baptized one day and the next day heading off as an apostle off to, you know, another country. Um, and, you know, the Lord moved people in and out um, of these wonderful opportunities to serve. It's just it's really neat. It's a great, great question. Um, church story from December of 1842. Uh, we'll see that before Joseph's death, before this martyrdom, uh, June 27th of 1844, that uh, Willard will complete Joseph's personal history through August of 1838. And we'll see much of what we know will come from, from Willard. And so we really have to thank him for all this. Uh, of course, he was there. He was using it, using it, using it, okay? Right? Okay? You can imagine the cane beating away the, the rifle barrels. Uh, of course, there was this prophecy that you know, he would not he'd be unharmed, you know, and just amazing. All the bullets are flying you know, through the window, through the door. Here he is whacking everybody, you know, like the, the whack-a-mole at the, you know, amusement parks. And, um, and he was absolutely not injured. It's a true, true miracle. When, you know, John Taylor, who's also with him, had all these serious, serious wounds, almost died. Um, anyway, so truly amazing. Uh, he would migrate with the saints. He would first go to winter quarters in 1846. Eventually, he'd make it over in 1847 to the valley. Um, he would then become a second counselor in the church presidency, what we would call the first presidency today. And this would be in December of 1847. Um, and he would have many different opportunities. He was editor of Deseret News, postmaster of Salt Lake City, and he would die true and faithful um, in 1854. So just what a neat life. And we'll sort of get to meet him here at the beginning of these journals. All right, with that said, then here is our first, speaking of the, the red brick store. Um, and here I am, this was uh, October of 2012. My wife and I, we went on the getaway, just the two of us. It was very uh, just spiritual and fun, and it was regenerating for so many reasons. It was awesome. Um, okay, so with that said, let's take a look at this entry, uh, and let's reason and then relate together. This is the 13th of December, 1841. Um, and I want you to really try not just to read with the source, right, but also try to read against the source, asking yourself questions uh, about what's here and what's not here and what does it mean that this is here. Because really, you could have a field day with, I mean, almost every word, you know, in it and find some principle, some lesson that really we could apply and, and be so blessed by. Uh, so with that said, here's the entry, just a little excerpt for you. This day, Joseph the Seer and President of the Church appointed Willard Richards, recorder for the temple, and the scribe for the private office of the President, just opened in the upper story of the new store, and the recorder, the Willard, entered on the duties of his office. So, what would you reason would be principles, lessons, truths, that the Lord would want us to know to become better disciples of the same thing. What do you see in that? There's so many things. Please. One thing I noticed in my reading is that Willard Richards, the day he was called, he made his first entry. Yes! And that is kind of alluded to there where it yeah. says the recorder mm -hmm. entered on the duties of his office. Yes. 
And I just thought, what an example of he did not delay, he was called, he went to work. Yeah. Didn't wait around for the online training. I mean, you know what I mean? Right. I just thought that was yeah. really a lesson to us. Oh. And, I, and I, I love that reasoning. And once again, you know, you know, it doesn't even say it explicitly, but yet, as you really think about it, once again, reading against the source, along with with it, kind of reading between the lines, you're like, this is powerful. This is powerful for me. Thank you for that relating, too. Please. This is up there. I know how hard I have to work to stay up with things. Mm -hmm. And there are many days when I don't get an entry made for right. a record. Right. And now, and, and I'm going along with something that's already established. Right. The Prophet, Brother Richard, and all the others were starting something brand new. Mm -hmm. They had every detail and angle to address. They had critics at the time. Mm -hmm. And now, the entire church and the world are going to scrutinize everything they do from day to day and we're going to poke fingers or point fingers right. and we're going to find fault with it, it's it's mind-boggling that it still stands mm. because i'm not sure that my record right. is going to stand <gasps> when i need it to yeah it's, it's absolutely amazing mm. to me. it truly must be the work of the Lord. thank you Thank you so much for that. And, and you just you think about how hard, with all the other things going on, they had every excuse. People were trying to kill them and run them out of town. All, all these lawsuits. You see, Joseph is, is really, I mean, he is going to uh, really struggle with, especially, the, and this will actually be a very large part of the journal. I don't know if you've read ahead, or, uh, but this idea, uh, they're trying to extradite him for trial because of an assassination attempt, or an alleged assassination attempt on Governor Wilbur W. Boggs. And they say, well, Joseph was behind it. And this whole, much of this journal is Joseph trying to find a way to not be extradited back for this alleged crime. On top of you know, everything else. On top of everything else. You know, all the doctrine, about, they're, they're building a temple, they're building a city. They're, I mean, and the loss of a child. Yeah. It, it's almost too much to comprehend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. I love that reasoning and that relief. Thank you. Anything else that stands out to you? Please, Sarah. I think it's wonderful that they had, because with the temple, there's so much that goes on in the temple and it's been going on for years. Me, a reporter for the temple, Especially now, we're grateful for that now because of the records that were kept yeah. and just how much is going now and how we needed that organization mm. through the years. Even though it was just that one temple and it could have been like, well, <laughs> but they kept so, they were, it's just interesting to me that it was established from the very beginning, reported for the temple, this is going to happen. And I, that's important to me. Yeah. That was just something. Yes, but yeah. the Lord's house is a house of order. I mean, truly, I, I love that. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I think I think there's so many things here. Um, if, if I may, um, because this is this has stood out to me of all of the titles that Willard could have used. Notice he only picked one for Joseph. We don't know why, but just would you reason with me? Why do you think Willard may have picked Seer as the title? Said. And, and, and I really love that. Think about what Willard has seen. Right? He's been with them from Kirtland. He's seen all the ugliness of Missouri. 
And here's Joseph still you know, at the helm, looking optimistically forward to this grand... I mean, you, you remember the first presidency letter. The greatness of God and let's rejoice. I mean, just take a look. Um, you know, the work of the Lord, you know, one of vast magnitude, almost beyond comprehension, the glory of the past description. It, it's glorious. They've just been chased out. They've been killed. Their children have been murdered. I mean, the glories, and you say, well, wait a minute. There's a man with perspective, but not just a man. There is a seer, a true seer. You know, and, and I love that. Thank you for that comment. Um, oh, fantastic. Well, with, with that said, as, as you think about um, all of these wonderful opportunities, you, you can imagine you know, here we have this, this bottom floor here, and of course there's the top floor, and this is going to be built, and, you know, but you can still imagine. Um, imagine we were there in this little office, you know, he's just scribbling away in this beautiful, beautiful you know, handwriting, uh, and we're, we're going to see him recording things that will be so sublime for, for all of us to still have today. As you think about your own efforts to keep some record, um, and, and remember, as prophets have taught many times today, uh, certainly a journal is, is a way, but there are many, many ways these days to, to keep records. You know, be it you know, like blog, if you have, you know, the, what is it, take a picture and write a caption or something. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of ways you can keep records, you, you can save things. I mean, um, anyway, but whatever it is for you, would you come back with me? Uh, because as, as you'll see, when prophets talk about journal keeping today, many of them go back again and again and again to this wonderful, uh, prophet of God, President Kimball, who spoke so clearly about journal keeping. Uh, this was actually to the youth of the church, and it was one of the reasons why I picked it, because we have many who are, are, are younger, um, you know, here. Um, I, I think this is important to know that in the new era, in October 1975, we we're getting ready to celebrate this wonderful, you know, bicentennial um, you know, coming year, uh, and here we have President Kimball writing to the young people of the church, but really to all of us, about record keeping. What I'd like you to do is would you take a look here and would you read through for yourself and let's just relate this to us. Before we relate though, let's reason principles of record keeping taught by this great prophet of the Lord and then would you tell me, after you've reasoned a principle, how you would want to relate that to yourself. For example, you might say something such as, let's see, experiences of work, relations with people. Welcome, David. Uh, an awareness of the rightness and wrongness of actions will always be relevant. And you might say, okay, I need to talk about these things in my journal. Perhaps that's a principle. And then you might say something to the effect of, how are my relations with people? Would my posterity love to know how I dealt with ornery people? Would they love to know how I tried to deal with delightful people? What I like to do in my associations with others, you know? Uh, whatever it might be for you. Go, go through here and please reason principles of record keeping and then relate to yourself which ones you would like to implement in your own efforts to keep record. Okay? So just take a moment and, and then we'll go around and talk about what we thought.
when you're ready, go ahead and tell us the principle that you reason about record keeping and how you'd like to relate that principle to your own life. Sorry. I think it's interesting because in the recent general conference they also talked about um, just even posts on Facebook, which isn't, it's kind of, a, it's, right. but they were, at the end it talks about not accentuating the negative. Right. And it's funny because um, in general conference they said, now don't be fake. Mm -hmm. Don't be fake right, online right. just because you're online. Mm -hmm. And then so someone that I know of did was like, Okay then. So she started talking about absolutely everything bad in her yeah. life and it was just interesting that there's those two extremes. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if sometimes I go extreme in every right. single like, oh, blah, 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 right. and then go negative. Right. And then I just, it's funny to remember that to portray a life you have to have both right. and an equal me uh, nah, on an equal measure, measure. And I think that's very important to help um, posterity also know that, yeah, I have bad times and I have good times, right. and that's how it's supposed to work. Because mm -hmm. I wonder if sometimes people get into the mode of thinking that everything has to be negative, mm -hmm. or everything has to be positive, and that there's no middle ground. Right. Because sometimes you do read that. <laughs> I love that. Right? There are so many gospel principles that balance mm -hmm. and temper each other. Yeah. You know, and, and truly think, you know, we don't have all mercy and we don't have all justice that right? God is able to perfectly balance both and really if, if you think of it you know justice could be the negative mercy could be the positive you know, we are to balance them right? thank you for that great <laughs> insight other principles about record-keeping that you reason and how you'd like to relate them please there are kind of a couple that relate to each other about Record the way you face up to your challenges that beset you, yeah. and then related to that, tell of problems as you will tell of problems as old as the world and how you dealt with them. Mm. I think that can be so valuable to someone else and even to yourself yes. later to look yes. back. Oh, I had this problem. This is how I dealt with it. I can probably deal with this new problem. Right. You know? Right. It can give you instruction and hope. Oh. Well, I, I did it once, and it worked out, and oh, okay, I can do it again, you know, right. as hard as it might be. I love that. We can learn from the past, as we record it, <laughs> to learn from. Yeah, and, and then I, like Sarah said, I liked that part about it just being your true self. Right. You know, not dwell on the negative, but right. not avoid the negative. Right. Yeah. Love that. Thank you so much. Other principles? Please. So often in the prophet's entries, he glorifies God. Yes. Regardless of what's happening. And I think that's what he sees us here and he sees the other from the beginning. Right. He glorifies God in virtually every entry. Mm. Thank you. Oh, I think that's such an important thing to remember. That no matter what we're going through, right, we can see God's glory in it or because of it, or, you know, in spite of it. Or, and yeah. we can see his will being fulfilled, mm -hmm. even when we're writing about Thomas Mill. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, and, and you think about these, these very serious lessons of following the prophet. Joseph said to leave, don't stay. The prophet's counsel wasn't heeded, and we see what happens. I mean, I mean as, as sombering as that is, but, oh, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, all right. With that said, as we think then, I, I just this is an invitation. If there is anything um, in the principles that you reason that you really felt the Holy Ghost nudge you to start applying in your own life today, I would just invite you to do it. Um, God knows what you need to do, and He will let you know. Uh, all right. Now, with that, so let's take a look then. Uh, here's our next entry. This is the 26th of December. Here's the day after Christmas, 1841. Uh, they're just a few days shy of the new year, 1842. We'll see. Uh, that here we have, uh, this is a public meeting, and, and it's wonderful. And, and I was so excited 
um, as, as, as I was thinking of Sarah, being in our midst and going off on a mission, this is important for you. You said you don't speak a lick of Spanish, right? <laughs> well, this is important. Okay? Um, the public meeting of the saints was at President Joseph Smith's house on Sunday evening, December 26th, and that the patriarch Hiram Smith and Elder Brigham Young had spoken on the principles of faith and the gifts of the Spirit. President Joseph read the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians and a part of the 14th chapter and remarked that the gift of tongues was necessary in the church, but that if Satan could not speak in tongues, he could not tempt a Dutchman or any other nation but the English. For he can tempt the Englishman, for he has tempted me, and I am an Englishman. But the gift of tongues by the power of the Holy Ghost in the church is for the benefit of the servants of God to preach to unbelievers as on the days of Pentecost, when devout men from every nation shall assemble to hear the things of God. Let the elders preach to them in their own mother tongue, whether it is German, French, Spanish, or Irish. Or Irish. <laughs> or, any, <laughs> or any other. And let those interpret who understand the language spoken to them. <coughs> in their mother tongue. And this is what the Apostle meant in 1 Corinthians 14, 27. What principles, what lessons, what truths would you reason from this wonderful meeting that was had the day after Christmas of 1841? When I was reading this, it totally reminded me of the um, people in General Conference giving the talks in yeah. the native tongues. I thought, wow. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. And we have people to interpret it. It's great. Right. Thank you so much for that. That was a neat, neat development. Yeah. Other principles, lessons, truths that you would reason? Sarah. Um, I love this quote. <laughs> it's, it's funny because when I first opened my call, that was one of the first things that got to me because I thought, oh, I could do a foreign language. You know, I've learned French before. Sure. I'm probably going to go French speaking. Yeah. I can do this. And then I got down to Spanish and suddenly there was just this panic in the back of my head, which was so weird to me because I thought I would be able to do it and that it wouldn't stress me out so much. Right. And then it's slowly become one of the biggest stresses from preparing for my mission. Mm. And it's funny because it feels like repeatedly I keep on such as in this class or the gift of tongues keeps on coming up mm. or when I get letters from friends and it just continually comes up even though I don't usually voice the fact that I am worried about that right. and it's just it's almost like he's trying to talk to me and say hey calm down it's okay <laughs> you got this and it's wonderful that it's saying yes the gift of tongues is necessary for the church and because it is necessary for the church I will provide it and you will be able to teach in the tongue um, of the people. And, so, and it's wonderful that he blesses every missionary with that. And some missionaries don't end up being able to speak it. That's what I was, you know, you're like, well, oh, I never actually learned this, but I was able to speak through the Spirit, which I think is the gift of tongues as well. Of course. So. <laughs> I, lo I love that. Sarah, thank you. Um, and, and I just want to testify that I do know that God loves all of his children enough to help them to hear the message of the restoration in their own tongue. Um, and that's huge to know that, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, he loves you too, um, but you're going to be able to affect, I mean, thousands upon thousands of people um, by the missionary work that you do. And just think of how much he loves each one of them as well. Um, you know, if it's expedient, he will provide a way. Uh, and, and this is just so reassuring. In fact, I, I love looking at, you know, uh, this is here, this is Elder Oaks. Uh, this is in the end of September 1986. Just another wonderful address on the gift of tongues. One that wants to get quoted again and again on this topic, spiritual gifts um, in particular. Um, and, and I think as you take a look here, um, let's take let's, let's help Sarah out, but, but of course let's help all of us out um, to try to understand. Right? Once again, the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation of tongues, right? they always go together. Um, but what we see here is that there are many, many gifts. And this is for all of us. So let's try to figure out how we can relate the principles in this quote to ourselves so that we can help God's children more effectively. The gift of the Holy Ghost is conferred on both men and women. So are spiritual gifts. 
as Elder Bruce R. McConkie declared in Nauvoo at the dedication of the monument to a woman, where spiritual things are concerned as pertaining to all of the gifts of the Spirit, with reference to the receipt of revelation, the gaining of testimonies and seeing of visions, in all matters that pertain to godliness and holiness, and which are brought to pass as a result of personal righteousness, in all these things, men and women stand in a position of absolute equality before the Lord. He is no respecter of persons, nor of sexes, and he blesses those men and those women who seek him and serve him and keep his commandments. Spiritual gifts do not come visibly, automatically, and immediately to all who have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Prophet Joseph Smith taught that most such gifts are not visible to the natural vision or understanding of man, and that it requires time and circumstances to call these gifts into operation. The scriptures tell us that we should desire and zealously seek spiritual gifts. We are also told that some will receive one gift and some will receive another. So what stands out to you that we can relate in our own pursuit of these wonderful gifts that God wants to give us to bless his children? I don't know if you shared with this class yet of your experience with this with the Korean language. And, which is not an easy language. But then when you were asked to learn uh, Korean sign language and what happened in the temple, yeah. I mean, I think that's a beautiful example. And you even mentioned that when you left the temple and you tried to recall some of the things, you, you, you needed it at that time, but afterwards it was very difficult to recall how to do certain things. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. that happened for that and there was someone in the temple that day that needed that and that needed to have that inspiration flowing and i'm sure you would have loved to have left the temple and been able to write right. all those things <laughs> but that wasn't part of that gift at that point that was you needed it for a specific reason and then we had um we took a foreign exchange student into our home from france in the summer in july and she was only with us for about three or about four weeks. Then she came to church with us for the first time in a Mormon church. And a gentleman got up for, it was fast in, I think it was fast in testimony. I hope my memory is certain right. But while he's up there talking, I didn't know him very well, know any of his background, nothing. All of a sudden, near the end of it, he said, I feel inspired. I don't know. He didn't even say I feel inspired. He goes, I feel like I should bear my testimony to you in French. Now, I've been attending sacrament meetings in the United States for a very long time. Right. And I've never had someone all of a sudden say, besides maybe a return to me, that just got back. I've never had someone just say, I feel like I should bear my testimony in French. And he started to bear his testimony in French, and Kent and I are like, kind of avoiding each other a little bit, because she's on the row with us, and she's just listening to this testimony in perfect French. And we just knew it was for her. And and she and when he got done he goes, I don't know why I did that and now and, and later on of course we had to tell him that why but but it was it was just it did never happen again before or after. But something needed to happen right at that time. And so it's so important to listen. And who knows, it may have been many years since he had even spoken to her. But it came you know, out so beautifully at that time. The Lord uses that tool. He hasn't given that gift to me yet, or I don't know if I'll experience it in this long time, but I'm so grateful for when it happens to others. Thank you so much for that. And I, I am just so moved by just the love that I would for And that he would inspire that man at that time to bear that testimony in French. You know, I have never heard a French testimony sacrament. I mean, you know what I mean, in my life. Um, and I think that's so amazing. Um, thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. And, and I hope that every one of us remembers that even if God doesn't inspire someone to bear a testimony in a different language for us, um, that he is working on the other side of the veil for our good. I, well, I know that's true. Um, and so I guess my question is, I wonder what he's doing today for you and for me. So thank you for sharing that. Anything else stuck out to you 
Please. Well, I'm going to share what happened today. So my husband and I were at a funeral, and um, so my husband is in the state presidency. He was on the stand, and he did not know he was on the program. But uh, he was to give some remarks at the end, and um, you know, he he just used a scripture that fit so aptly to the life of this man, and um, it was in the Doctrine and Covenants, and it was addressing a man. Um, I can't remember his first name, but his last name was Miller, and that was the last name of this man yeah. for the funeral. And it just described him as a man who's without guile and who the Lord loves, and he just explained it to this man, and he just did it so beautifully. And um, he made it look so easy to get up there and say something um, in a difficult circumstance. But afterwards, I said, you know, I really think you have a gift of the Spirit to speak, and it has the Spirit touched so many people when you speak, and he said, well, I can't take any credit of myself. It really is from the Spirit, and I just want to set people to have my Father. So I just thought, mm, that's such a good way to look at it. It's, it's not me, but I'm so glad that my Father can work through me right. and help and bless other people. Thank you for sharing that. That's a wonderful story. And I just love how we have so many reminders of God's love for us. These tender mercies are so abundant. Once we really started, we could sit together and just start on a roll. And if our memories would serve us well, or if we had journals and other things to help remind us, we could talk all day about these wonderful stories. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I, I, I do um, want you to know that, that I am grateful um, for each one of you and for the spiritual gifts that you have. I, I mean, I, I could make a guess that perhaps some of them I know, you know some of you longer than, than others, and, and I, I could certainly say, I think maybe you or you, or maybe you have that, you know, um, but, but the most important thing is I know that God knows what gifts you have. And remember, we can certainly develop others as needed to bless his children. He wants us to. Um, and so um, I just would like to invite us to really ask him, what are my gifts and how should I be using them? Um, and which one should I be seeking to add to my quiver, you know, so that I can help the work even more? Um, you know, and, and I, I, I did, I did want to, um, I did want to look, uh, actually, just for a moment, at, and, and perhaps tell a little bit of this, this story that, um, that Mrs. Hansen was alluding to uh, here, because, because I, have, I have to say, uh, that before in, in my life, I really didn't know what the gift of tongues was. It, in fact, it sounded kind of strange to me. I don't know why. I think I don't like languages being called tongues. I get like a strange image, you know. Um, and, and so like, I was like, what does that mean? It sounds kind of weird, you know. Um, but, but this idea of the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues, and, and the Elder McConkie has taught that though they always do come together, um, which, is, which I thought was interesting. Um, as, as Mrs. Hansen said, I, I did serve a mission in South Korea. Um, and when I had been in the field for nine months, because I spent three months in the MTC, a mission president called me in when we had an interview at the time of, of transfers, and uh, he said that he wanted me to become a sign language missionary. Uh, and I said, oh, well, you know, what do you mean? And I don't uh, know any sign language, you know, and I certainly don't know the Korean sign language. And, and, and he said, you know, uh, it'll be okay, just, just go and buy some books at the bookstore and, and just start studying. And, and then you'll be fine, you know. Oh, really? You know, and I remember that was, you know, right before, and, and transfers came, and, and on July 31st of 2001, I rode a bus for three and a half hours through the winding mountains uh, of northern South Korea. And I went all the way through those mountains and eventually found myself in Seoul, and I was able to purchase some books and I started to read. Well, uh, by the time I was able to meet up with my companions, because I was going to be um, in a threesome for, for the first transfer of the Death Branch. Uh, I, we had our first you know, dinner, dinner appointment that night, which was really great. Uh, we, we almost never had dinner appointments. And it was with a member family, which was really nice. It was a, actually a husband and a wife. And we had known they were you know, less active. And so we went there. And I just remember watching them. And it, I mean, they might as well have been just doing this. You know, I mean, that, that is, I couldn't have distinguished anything they were doing from that. I mean, just, it made no sense at all. I mean, and I tried to study for a few hours, you know, like, well, surely I'd be able to recognize something, you know. Um, and I mean, I couldn't even fingerspell my name, you know, and all that. And so, I mean, it just started to set in. 
Oh, I end up feeling a little bit useless, but okay, hey, hey, but it's the first night. That's okay. You take courage. It'll be all right, you know. And so, you know, the next morning, uh, here I am in our kitchen. Uh, there wasn't room for me in the bedroom. We, we had actually had four other missionaries there, so I slept in the kitchen. And the cockroaches would, would go up one side, and then they crawl down the other. I'd hear them all night and wake up with them on my back and try to, to get them. Um, and I, I've noticed there are many different sizes of cockroaches. I can tell you a lot about it. I learned much that I more than I'd ever known. Um, but here's the thing. Basically, I didn't have a place to study, uh, and so I, I would use our little kitchen drawer. Uh, I'd, I'd set my book, you can see there, and I'd, I'd try to practice. This was the sign. It, it's a haganada, which is basically to yell at someone. And, and here's the poor person, and you can see. <laughs> see, I'm totally yelling at them. Anyway, um, but that was the sign. Um, and, so I, and so every morning I, I would practice, I'd work so hard, you know, and then we'd go out and, and we'd hit the streets, we'd try to find, it was kind of hard to find a deaf person, but you know, we'd try to go where someone, uh, where, you know, someone was deaf, and we'd go and, you know, I would be there, and once again, I would just see, you know, <laughs> and I'm staring, I'm staring, you know, and I just started to develop these headaches, and, and every single day I would have these horrible migraine headaches, because I was straining, um, and I was, okay, it's all right, you know, and, and then after the first month I was, you know, a little discouraged, you know, and, and been, oh, it's okay, it's only been the first month, and well, uh, and long story short, at, after four months of still, I mean, really just seeing the blurry hands, and I was looking for the signs, and I just couldn't pick them out, and it was too fast, um, and, I, and, uh, and I could barely do a little bit myself, um, I was really feeling down, um, and it was interesting to me because um, during this time, we were teaching with this wonderful man in Ego too, and um, brother, brother E, um, really was, he was so kind to me. I didn't even know what he was saying, but he would always, and Koreans are, this is very Korean, so don't, don't be weirded out by this, he'd always put his hand on my leg, you know, and he'd, you know, put his arm around me, and he'd hold my hand as we walked around the temple grounds, and, and it was very strange to me, and it was uncomfortable at first, but, but I realized that he was, he was just trying to show that he was trying to be a friend, and, and that was the way he did it. Anyway, I, I couldn't really talk with him about anything else, and so that was as close as we got um, to having, you know, uh, some connection. Anyway, it was so, so interesting because, you know, when he chose to be baptized, there was a sign that I know that I was able to pick out because he came out of the water, um, and I just signed something like, oh, you know, how do you feel, you know? Um, and he just, it's so simple, he just went like this. And he said, I feel clean. I feel clean. Um, and, I, and I remember, I said, okay, there's some hope here. Well, things got a little bit better, you know, and, um, and it was good, but it was still really hard. Um, and it, it was hard to understand things. But then a few months later, uh, we were able to teach um, a, a wonderful man named E.J. Ho, and we were able to start to interpret uh, for different events. He had his leg amputated, and it was all these things, and we helped him out um, with that. Uh, well, then a few months later, um, I you know, was looking back and saying, boy, I, you know, I've, really, um, I've really been able to um, feel a little bit better about this whole sign language thing. Uh, and so I finally then, just when I was feeling a little bit, you know, okay about it, I was this junior companion, no pressure, you know, and I would sit back and I would kind of hold the book, you know, for my companion, he was the one who did the, all the interpreting. Uh, and well then, you know, uh, they, they were gone, and here I am, I became a senior companion um, with a Korean um, who didn't know sign language, um, and then the Nauvoo Temple dedication happened. Um, it was so amazing because they asked us to interpret we had all of our members there. They were so excited to be invited via satellite to this temple dedication. Um, I remember being so, so nervous. Um, and it was one of those moments where I absolutely remember not understanding anything that was going on before the meeting started. You know, the state president's up there trying to give directions and you know, this, that, and the other, and no idea what was going on. Um, and then suddenly the dedication started, um, and I just felt my hands moving. I mean, I felt them doing signs, and I felt them simplifying things that I didn't even understand, and, and suddenly... Um, I was interpreting, and then it was amazing because the satellite connection went out, and I was still interpreting. Um, and it was amazing because then when the satellite came back after, you know, 20 seconds or something, it was right where they were, you know, it was telling some story, or, you know, it was, it was unbelievable. Um, and then, of course, you know, after the meeting, you know, the state president's like, wow, we saw you interpreting, it was so great. <laughs> what? what? What was that? You know, and he's like, well, no, no, I'm saying you did a good job. What? You did a good job. You did a good job. <laughs> oh, and then he says in English. I'm like, okay, great. You know. Uh, anyway, and then, then of course, there was the experience with, with Mrs. Hed that Mrs. Hedson talked about going to the temple. We finally had a member who qualified to go to the temple after years. I mean, years and years. Of, we didn't have any members who would go to the temple. 
He went into the temple, um, and I had not been to an endowment session in Korean. I mean, I didn't even understand it in English. I mean, you know what I mean? At that point, I was still trying to understand everything. And, uh, and there I was. And so, you know, we marched up to the temple, and, and my, my poor companion was like, we'll be able to help you in the temple. Because, you know, when we, we try to work together as a team and, you know, help each other interpret, oh, hey, this word, this word, or whatever. But in the temple, of course, you know, he's just sitting there, and just sitting silently, and there's our member. And he is so, so happy that he has finally qualified himself to come to the temple. He's gotten a recommend, and there he is, and he's just beaming, and he's signing, oh, this is going to be great. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, like, I'm feeling so horrible about everything. Um, and I just remember once again, um, when that endowment session started, I had absolutely no idea what was going on. And then I just felt my hands move. And for an hour and a half plus, my hands moved. And he was able to do all the things that he needed to do. And it was unbelievable. And yes, as soon as I walked out, I ran to somebody who knew me from my first area. And she was like, oh, you know, you know. And and I had no idea what she was saying. I had no idea what she was saying. And this was spoken Korean, you know? Um, anyway, I just want to testify. Sarah, please don't be worried. Because if it's expedient, God will help you. Right? Uh, and and I just, I'm so sure of that. Um, and I just want you to know that I saw it again and again and again. And yes, as I was coming home from my mission on the... You know, the, the elevator taking me to check in my bags. I was there. It was me. It was one other Korean. And I'm like, okay, I have now done this for two years. And I am going to have a great last, you know, conversation. Um, and here I am. And I, I gave the, the intro, you know, and, you know, you know, and, 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 you know, I say my little thing and I'm feeling so great. And he looked at me and he said, I'm sorry, I don't speak the English. <laughs> no, no! I mean, I was like, he was like, stab and twist and push you in the ground. You know? And I felt so horrible, but I have to say, and I didn't give up, I, I kept going, you know, and I gave him a fat long card, whatever I could. Um, but I just want you to know that to me was such a testimony. You know, that I was so absolutely weak and powerless in every way, and God made up the difference when it was expedient. And when it wasn't, he reminded me of how weak I was with him, which was also a great lesson. Um, anyway, so Sarah, you'll be great, because he's great. Um, all right. Um, anyone else like to share anything, just a testimony of God's ability to help us with these spiritual gifts when it is expedient to help his children whom he loves. I just want to thank you for your participation today. Um, you know, it's, it's so funny. We, we could talk about so many of these wonderful entries. And, um, you know, I always have more than we ever are able to, to do, but, but I want you to know that, that I have felt the Holy Ghost today. That I have felt that, that this lesson was, I mean, I'm sure for all of us um, in, in many ways, but I also think it was for some of us in very specific ways. Uh, and I'm grateful for the Lord's goodness um, and Him orchestrating any good that may have happened today. Um, and I do want to test it, um, that we can look forward to God's goodness in our lives. That no matter what is going on right now and how hard it might be, that he has so many gifts to give us. That his goodness, his power, his wisdom, his love is absolutely without bounds. Um, and I'm just so grateful for him and for his ability to change us in ways that allow us to be of good to his children. I just say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Tired. Would you offer our closing prayer, please? Yep. Thank you. Dear Karen, Ms. Lillian, Father, I thank you so very much for this day. I think that we go to have such a great day today so far. And we thank you that we could go to come in such a wonderful class. And we thank you that we could have this opportunity to be in this class. And we thank you for the spirit that we felt today. 
Yes, it was the good day and we say some questions. Thank you all so much. And Sarah especially, but anyone else, I, I, this was another one that I just thought might be so interesting. Elder Nelson gave a wonderful talk about preparing for your personal endowment. Um, have you received it yet? Um, no. Okay. I, I, um, I have oh. We're up oh, wonderful. Well, this is a really great talk. Uh, March 2002 Ensign. Uh, but what, particularly, um, he talks about some specific things to study in the scriptures that he thought would be helpful. And, and even chapters as well as topics in the Bible dictionary. Anyway, I just thought that might be helpful for you. But certainly the entire talk is just so wonderful. And in fact, he has given a, a variation of this talk at least five times um, in different ensigns and conferences. I mean, just so it's a really neat one. But, so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. How are your name for Joseph? All the good jobs. Oh, all the good jobs. Oh, good. Wonderful, wonderful name.